people. And I always like to start by acknowledging the indigenous people of the land. Uh, when we began this training last week, Eric Wilder, who is an amazing POMO artist and elder came and spoke and welcomed us and talked to us about the Kishaya history and culture. And that was a really beautiful experience. Uh, the Kashaya have been here for tens of thousands of years, really tending this land with an immense amount of skill and observation and uh, just compiled knowledge and wisdom about the land. And uh, it is my hope that the work we do in permaculture can also help us in some way to become tenders and healers and carers for the land. And that's always my goal in teaching and in learning and in all the ways that I try to practice and do permaculture. So uh, tonight, today we had a really wonderful tour uh, in Sonoma County of some great places of Singing Frogs Farm, which you can always Google and see what they do. They have an amazing um, no-till farming set up there, and they produce fantastic vegetables without having to dig up the ground and till it and expose it to soil. We went over to Eric Olson's place. Eric is someone who's taught with Earth Activist training. He has his own business called Permaculture Artisans. He's also an author of many different books and um, has a really wonderful place with a natural swimming pond and beautiful food forests. And then we went over to a place called Heron Shadow, uh, which is um, stewarded by Redbird Willie, who is a California Indian of a number of different tribes and it's land that is owned by the Cultural Conservancy to be a place for Native people to come and to heal and they are developing a beautiful permaculture uh, model there, um, a focusing on native plants and seed saving. And now, tonight, we're going to do the whirlwind global tour of what's going on in the permaculture world. Permaculture, for those of you who don't know what it is, is a whole system of ecological design. Uh, it draws a lot on traditional and indigenous, indigenous ecological knowledge, um, but it also puts it together with systems theory and science in some interesting ways and it has a set of ethics and guidelines that help us to meet our human needs um, but create systems that can do that and also can regenerate the lands around us and uh, he asked me if that's what we need in the world today so hopefully this little tour will give you some inspiration and some hope. So I'm going to begin with sharing my screen. And we're going to start with Belize. So we're going to start with, are you seeing Belize? Yeah, looks good. Okay. Um, so I taught there, I think it was 2014, in a place called Maya Mountain Research Farm. Uh, that's way up in the mountains in southern Belize. Uh, to get there, you have to go in a dugout canoe. It's on a beautiful river. Um, and get pulled up the river. Uh, or you have to hike over a steep and muddy mountain. Um, I'm glad I went when I could still get myself in and out of that canoe. <laughs> Not very gracefully, but I did it. <laughs> uh, really, really beautiful place. This is Christopher Nesbitt, who 
started the farm with some of his produce. And when he began, it looked something like this. It was a played out banana farm with nothing much on it, with soil that had been disrupted and um, disturbed and uh, wasn't terribly fertile. And he began planting. And in the tropics, things grow really quickly. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of solar energy. There's in the humid tropics, there's plenty of moisture. Fertility in the tropics is not so much held in the soil, but in the mass of vegetation. And he planted trees and bushes and flowers. And eventually what he created was something that looks like a jungle. You know, your image of a jungle. <laughs> um, but is actually everything on it was something that he put there and something that he planted there. Uh, we had some wonderful students there from many different aspects of life and beliefs. We had some Mayan students. Um, this beautiful young woman, Paula, uh, is Mennonite. Um, the Mennonites had a big missionary push in Belize. That's why she's wearing that dress. Um, but she was also, although she's very young, she was kind of like the head of the Women's Institute in her village. Um, we had an agricultural engineer. Uh, we had this beautiful young woman who everyone called Juicy because Christopher met her selling organic juices on the roadside and brought her to the class. Um, these young Mayan girls uh, were just teenagers, um, but this guy was a agricultural engineer. And we also had a couple of students from the Garifuna community. They are the people from the coastal areas of Belize, descendants of escaped slaves and Arawak Indians. And they tend to be the educators in Belize. Um, we made A-frames and dug swales and learned all kinds of wonderful techniques of permaculture. I co-taught this with Marisha Auerbach, um, you see there, and with Albert Bates, uh, who's a really expert on biochar uh, and lives at the farm in Tennessee. And It was an amazing experience to be able to be in this almost primeval looking forest. This woman, Miss Perlin, who was one of the Garifuna, um, there's a thing I've noticed gardeners do all over the world, which is you continually take cuttings of other people's plants and snip them off and take them home. And she was constantly collecting seeds and plants. Uh, Dr. Arzu, who's here, uh, is an herbalist and a healer. Um, she lives in a village that's sort of known for uh, ha having almost everyone in the village has a PhD. And her husband is the mayor of it. And she has her own amazing healing practice. So we were planting. And again, in the tropics, often there's so much fertility, you can just stick something into the ground and it will grow. And we had a couple amazing tours, um, bananas, papayas, all kinds of different plantains, cacao. We went to an organic cacao farm um, where the cacao is shade grown so they can grow an overstory of things that will provide native habitat and habitat for birds. Uh, cacao, of course, is what you make chocolate from, and there are many, many different varieties and great diversity within that. Is that what they did with it? Yeah. And did they, have, they sell to the states? Like a, what? Did they sell to the states? Are they like a multi? They have a, a small chocolate producing company. Um, 
I don't think they export a lot to the states as yet, but they do sell locally in Belize, and there aren't very many companies producing organic chocolate in Belize. What? I uh, didn't see any milk chocolate, no. Um, that's part of the food forests there we were working in. And we also had another tour to one of Christopher's ne neighbors. Um, where we actually had to like float down the river to get to his place. Uh, it was a lot of fun, actually, <laughs> just uh, swimming down river and climbing up. And he has this incredible food forest that he planted completely intuitively. He didn't know anything about permaculture. He didn't know anything about any of these theories. He just tuned into the land. He also had land that was a played out banana plantation and he just started planting and he created this incredibly rich and fertile environment again with masses of food plants of cacao of plantain of banana of all the wonderful tropical things another thing that they did a lot was make biochar uh, albert bates has written a number of books on biochar so you can see here they have a biochar kiln and we're stoking it up with wood. Um, there's a lot of different types of biochar kilns. This one, it's like a kiln inside a kiln. It's called a retort. So you have wood and stuff inside that central container and then you pack it with wood around on the outside and you light the wood that's on the outside, put a cover over it. As it burns down, it creates heat that basically bakes the wood on the inside and turns it into a very fine charcoal because biochar is charcoal that's made in a low oxygen environment. And when you make biochar, um, you're making something that can become a home for microorganisms has lots of little pores and spaces in it and you can grind it up and put it in the soil and it becomes a place where all of those beneficial microorganisms we've talked about here can live and hang out it's like you know a hotel for the beneficials um, and they would make biochar um, quite often there and used it whenever they were planting different things. This guy, Johnny Stolmeyer, is from Trinidad. He's an amazing poet, performer. Uh, this was a wonderful bicycle driven sort of coffee grinder. This was the old guy who had the food forest, and this is his uh, sugar press or sugar cane, where you put the sugar cane through this press and squeeze out the juice to get the sugar syrup, I guess, that you boil down into sugar. Yeah. Um, I thought I knew what brow chart was, but I don't think I do. What is brow chart? Yeah, it's um, biochar is charcoal that's produced in a low oxygen environment. Yeah. Yeah, so like I just said, it makes a home for microorganisms. And because it's got tiny, tiny little pores in it. And it will creates like a hotel. It's lots and lots of little tiny spaces where they can live and attach. Uh, so it can hold fertility in the soil. There's a whole story about it. Um, but I, Ajay, I'm gonna possibly need your help 
is I want to take us from Belize to another place. Yeah. Take us now to Cuba. Okay. Ajay is our teaching assistant, and uh, he's also our technical wizard here. All right, so Cuba, another wonderful tropical place um, where there was an international permaculture convergence in 2013. And these, um, these had been happening pretty regularly about every two years in different places. And um, I've been really fortunate to go to a number of them. And uh, there are times where people from all over the permaculture world can get together, can share stories, can share research, talk about what they're doing, meet each other, um, expand on different ideas, and also kind of help um, talk about permaculture, promote it in the local area. So in Cuba, Cuba, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it lost its markets and it lost its source of oil. And they say that the average Cuban lost a third of their body weight in that first year. Um, so, what they did was they localized and they found many ways to produce food without having to um, use so much oil and gas and transport it so far away. Right? So Cuba is beautiful, beautiful tropical island. Uh, the place where old cars go to have a second life. <laughs> it's uh, very part of Cuban culture. Somehow they got all these old cars from the 50s and because of the US embargo for so many years, they couldn't get newer cars and couldn't get newer car parts. And so they became really experts at refurbishing these cars. And uh, it was, you know, it was really interesting to like see what was probably my old family car from the 50s and the first one I ever drove <laughs> driving around in Cuba. Um, again, the tropics, you can produce this tremendous diversity of food because there is so many resources. Um, we were able to visit a number of different places that were, uh, Right outside of Havana, we had a one day tour there. Um, there was an organization there that had started a lot of permaculture gardens just in people's little backyards and little areas. They called them their sistemas, their systems. And they each had like a little name, they each had a different quality. Um, and we had a lot of Cubans with us at the convergence. I really loved this woman because she told me I danced like a Cuban. Um, and this was her little sistema, and just like her backyard garden, but she would reused very creatively all these materials to create planting areas, old insides of refrigerators to be plant stands. She had little polycultures of vegetables everywhere. And a little pond. Um, and you could see that she not only was producing food, she was having a whole lot of fun with it. 
This is the organization, Fundacion Antonio Nunez Jimenez, uh, that had sponsored teaching all of this permaculture. This was another little sistema called Mi Sueño, My Dream. And it was, again, like a lush jungle, but full of things like bananas, papayas, um, moringa, food that you can eat. Uh, John Valenzuela is a local permaculturalist here from Sonoma County who's a real expert on tropical fruits and unusual fruits. And I tended to follow him around because he knew about everything. And this is Moringa, uh, which is almost like a miracle plant in the tropics. It's got leaves that you can eat that are high in protein. It's a legume, so it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, its pods, if you drop them in water, will help clarify and purify the water. Um, it'll help build your soil. And it's almost like a, a superfood, very high in nutrition. Uh, this was another one of the little backyard gardens where they did a lot of teaching and training. You can see here's a banana circle with uh, greens and vegetables growing all around it in a little polyculture. Uh, that's water catchment from the roof. Um, they also did a lot of creative adaptation to not having oil and gas. Like using horses as transport, or donkeys, bicycles. This was the local fruit peddler coming around on his bicycle cart. Uh, it's John and Brock Dolman from Occidental Arts and Ecology Center showing a little leg in front of a living fence. And again, in the tropics, often you can just stick things into the ground and they'll grow because it's so warm and humid and fertile. The other thing they did in Cuba was more conventional organic farms, but placing them really close to the city. So this is an agroponico. Uh, it's called an agricultural farm, all organic, because they could no longer get the pesticides and the herbicides. And this was growing right in the outskirts of Havana. Uh, they had a little shop where they sold their products. And they had a beautiful little Santeria altar in the middle of the garden. And at the Convergence, we met at a place that was kind of like a government resort for Cuban people. Uh, it was very simple little cement huts, um, but right on the ocean, beautiful ocean. And that's Penny Livingston, who is the first permaculture teacher I had. Uh, I'm going to be teaching again with her next summer up in Canada. And lots of opportunities to experience the bounty. That's Pandora Thomas, who also teaches with Earth Activist Training. She started the Black Permaculture Network, and she has a wonderful farm called Earthseed here in Sonoma County. That's uh, a resource place for Black farmers and farmers of color. And then we went up into the highlands and Got to see this uh, system was built on an old flower farm that was turned into a permaculture demonstration site. Beautiful hedgerows of flowers and a wonderful mandala garden uh, looking at patterns of nature to make beautiful food. And they also did some of the first cob building in Cuba, with this little thatched cottage. And we visited a place up in the mountains uh, where he kind of collected trees and 
unusual fruits and vegetables. So it's just a sampling of all the different fruits that he had growing at one time. Uh, and we also got to visit a natural park with these amazing trees with bromeliads and orchids and everything growing on them. So that's a little bit of Cuba. And now, We're going to go to a whole different kind of ecosystem. Any questions? Help me again, Ajay. Even though this is a Zoom meeting, you can still ask questions. OK, so now for something completely desert, different, we're going to the desert of Jordan, where the permaculture convergence met in 2011. Um, Jeff Lawton is kind of the protege of Bill Mollison, who was one of the founders of the movement. And his wife, Nadia, is Jordanian. He's worked a lot with the Jordanian government. Um, Jordan is a country that basically does not have enough water for the amount of people that it has. A lot of it's desert. Um, they've also taken in a lot of refugees from other Middle Eastern countries. Um, so permaculture and some of its lessons on how we can use water and how we can deal with dry lands is really important in Jordan and really important around the world because our, one of our great crises, though you wouldn't know it from the last week up here where we've had <laughs> rain every single day until today, practically. Um, and one of our great global crises is the lack of water and drought. And permaculture has some strategies for working with that. So the convergence was in a place called Captain's Camp down in the south in the desert, um, where there's still Bedouins with camels. Very beautiful in its kind of very stark way. Um, and we met under these beautiful tents. There's Bill Mollison right there. This one of the last ones that he was able to attend. Um, we had people from all over. These are Israeli permaculturalists who came. Uh, that's Bill's wife riding a camel, having a moment of communion with the camel. <laughs> and for me, one of the highlights was after the conference. The conference was great and met so many people and learned so much. And then after, we had a permaculture tour to Petra. Petra is one of the great archaeological sites of the world. Uh, it's a city that's kind of like a hidden city in the desert. Um, that's thousands of years old. And our tour focused on how they actually used water. Um, the culture is called the Nabatians, and they were experts at using water in dry lands. And it's one of the things we can learn a lot often from how people adapted to their environment long ago when they didn't have the kinds of options we have of moving water around and doing things in ways that are highly energy intensive and often not very smart. Um, the rock there is very soft, so these giant buildings are like carved out of the living rock. And 
there was a natural spring that filled a giant sort of reservoir up above the city. And then to get into the city, you hike through this canyon. It goes between these giant big cliffs on either side. And all through the canyon were these like little water channels that were sculpted in and carved in. So the water flowed down and they were engineered to drop at a very, very slight drop all the way through. So the water moved slowly, but it moved there. And the overhang kind of protected it from um, the sunlight from being evaporated, from things dropping into it. And there were places where they built these up like little aqueducts. Um, but an amazing feat of engineering. If you've ever tried to lay out like a pipeline or something over a long distance, it's not that easy. And that's what the canyon looks like when you're hiking through it. And then you come out into this, you know, these incredible temples and amazing city center. Um, so some of these old techniques for dry lands are capturing water and storing it in cisterns and rain catchment. Um, traditionally in the Middle East, they would have these underground water storage cisterns that would be waterproofed with some kind of lime plaster. Um, and then you could draw the water out and it was kept cool underground, so it didn't grow a lot of creepy things and dark. Uh, this was a well in Jordan. And so it's in one of the villages we visited where they were growing trees. And in the drylands, what you want to do is you want to surround them with mulch, and plant them in wells so that they've got uh, something to capture the water in, a little berm around it, you know, so they could flood irrigate that, the water can sink in, and they mulch around it to keep the soil moist. We visited Nadia's farm in this area, very close to the Dead Sea, where the soil is like, it's like white. It's, you know, the opposite of that lovely, lush, fertile, tropical stuff. It's cracked, it's dry, um, and it's hard to grow anything there. There's Nadia. And that's kind of what the area looks like. Uh, it's pretty barren. Uh, but they created this farm and they terraced it. Um, so digging swales and terraces, as we've talked about, are ways of capturing that water and having it sink into the ground instead of running off. And then they planted a lot of very tough desert trees like acacias and mesquites, things that uh, can grow with hardly any water and also uh, fix nitrogen, many of them. Uh, and then what they do is they chop and drop them. They cut them down, let them re-sprout and regrow, or they limb them up and they use that organic material to build the soil. Because in this desert, it's hard to even find stuff to mulch with. Um, they also had a little duck pond with some ducks and they had a little vegetable growing area under some shade cloth because the sun there is actually almost too hot for vegetables and just bake them alive with drip irrigation and mulch again and then plant fruit trees in and among the uh, the desert trees And so you can see them building soil in these little wells in this really white, barren area. And there's Bill again. And then we were able to visit 
um, a couple of places in the West Bank of Palestine. Uh, this is the wall the Israelis are building to separate Palestine itself um, from Israel proper along the border to prevent Palestinians from being able to come into Israel. Um, I had been there some years before um, doing solidarity work with a group called the International Solidarity Movement that supported the nonviolent resistance in Palestine against the occupation. And that was a powerful experience for me. My background is Jewish. I had been raised in typical American Jewish, you know, family with Israel is, you know, we love Israel. Israel is like our savior from the Holocaust. And it was a big shift in my consciousness to be able to say yes, and uh, Israel has done a lot of colonizing of people who were also there instead of sharing the land. And um, to me, Judaism was always about standing up for justice. And I think it's important to do that even when it doesn't necessarily fit your own self-interest. Um, so I had a lot of trouble getting in to Israel because I had tried to get in a couple years before and been turned away because they don't like people who've been uh, working with Palestinian activists. Mm -hmm. um, but with the permaculturalists, I was able to get back in, which I was very happy about. Um, but this is sort of the wall is this incredible scar on the landscape, as well as the damage that it's doing to people. Um, it's doing immense ecological damage as well. Uh, that was what was going on when I had been there in 04, and there were Palestinian villagers who were resisting the wall, uh, standing up to tear gas in the olive groves. Um, but this trip was more peaceful. Uh, we got to see some of the ancient ruins. And again, th that also had cisterns and water catchment. Um, we got to see beautiful wildflowers. Uh, you can see these are some of the terraces and the ancient uh, stonework. Thousands, some of it thousands of years old that people have been farming and raising olives and growing on these hills for tens of thousands of years. And you can see that the old landscape, uh, the wall, some of the new settlements there. Yeah. Imagine the work, you know, centuries of, of terracing all of that land. Um, but that means, you know, olives are really tough trees. They can grow with very little water. They're one of the few trees you can actually transplant when they're big and uh, old and they'll survive. Um, they can grow for a thousand years and they can produce olives for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, they're an amazing resource to grow on, and they'll grow on land that has very low fertility. So they have been what people have used as sustenance in areas, um, again, for centuries and in um, Palestine, Israel, Greece, and many other places where over centuries agriculture has really depleted the land. You know, olives have been the sustenance for people. Uh, this is one of the roadways that were built to separate the Palestinians from the Israelis and the settlers. Uh, and this was area we were taken to 
dumping raw sewage out onto the Palestinian lands. It was uh, really quite shocking to see. Um, but there are places where they're still farming in the old ways. You know, many of those terraces are too small, too narrow to bring in tractors or heavy equipment. So they're still using donkeys and uh, animal power. Uh, and this was um, something a, that a group of mostly English uh, biologists set up near Bethlehem uh, that was a little permaculture center we visited called Bustan Caraca. And they built, uh, they did a natural building with a bottle wall that was the most extreme bottle wall I've ever seen. <laughs> I don't know where they got all those bottles, uh, but it was quite amazing. It was Tom, some of our group, and they had taken these olives that had fallen out of production, swaled the area, irrigated it, and brought them back into production. Um, they were botanists and biologists, so they had collected many, many different types of desert trees and native trees, and we're planting them to uh, see what would grow and to see what natives would work in that environment. Mesquite comes from uh, the American Southwest, um, but it's a nitrogen fixer. It has pods that you can make a kind of flower from. Um, the indigenous people used it a lot. Uh, it has a kind of sweetness that doesn't cause diabetes. Um, other kinds of acacias. Uh, they built water storage where they captured the water in the winter and shaded it so it wouldn't evaporate. It's very simple. Um, there is also a woman who is doing aquaponics in the village. And aquaponics is a way of growing fish with water uh, and plants in a system where it circulates. So plants clean the water and um, then the fish poop in the water, <laughs> and that fertilizes the plants. And you can grow with 70 to 90% less water than in uh, growing in the ground. Um, in Palestine, because they don't have access to the ocean anymore, it's hard to get fish. So this could be a way of providing both fish and fresh greens people and they were using a lot of recycled like old um, containers and shipping containers and things. Duckweed, azola is a kind of water plant that you can feed to the fish and it also helps clean the water. And that was their system. And then we visited Marta Permaculture Farm, where I was able to go back later, a year later, and teach a permaculture course. And uh, this was started by Murad al Hufash in his village, native village. And he's got a beautiful permaculture system there. Um, that was Jillian Hovey who co-taught with me. And these are some of the ancient olive trees. Really amazing to see these trees that are hundreds of years old. Um, the trunks have just braided themselves together. Um, people put rocks in them and to try to give them some more weight and help them stand up to the wind. And um, they're just like ancient, ancient ancestors there. And it's a very beautiful village. 
Uh, that's a view from the top, looking down on some of the olive groves and the village itself. Murad says, up on the top there is an Israeli settlement called Ariel. That's one of the oldest and largest. And when you say a settlement, what it is, it's, it's more like a suburb. You know, when I hear settlement, I think of some, you know, like a, a log fence out in the wilderness somewhere and a cabin. But it's like a giant gated community surrounded by barbed wire. Um, and Murad said in his childhood, they used to play soccer up on top of there, but now you can't go there if you're Palestinian. It's guarded and there are machine guns and everything to keep you out. But this was an ancient cistern we ran across hiking in the hills. Uh, this was one of the local donkeys wandering around. We have a donkey that wanders around these hills a lot over by our ranch, and I felt like they were, somehow they were linked. So Murad has done a Mediterranean food forest with overstory of olives and other fruit trees and understories of things like perennial vegetables, um, herbs, um, shrubs and berries and he also has some big greenhouses where he does more commercial growing um for uh for sale and to support the enterprise and for an area that's very dry and that gets only winter rainfall um he had i thought he had very impressive gardens growing it's one of our students meditating in the olives um this was the ancient the castle from the um the uh turkish times in the, like the 1500s that actually belonged to murad's family and one of the women in our group worked for an organization that was restoring a lot of the historic architecture in Palestine. So we got to go and visit it. And uh, there are people still living in parts of it that hadn't fallen down. And we got to go see inside some of the rooms. You could tell that they were once very elegant, very beautiful. And then this is Murad's family house at the top of the village. And we did a little natural building project with packing tires with rocks. Um, we made sure the women got to do some of the fun work and not just sit around and Look feminine. I said we had to get the men to do some of the work too, <laughs> not just sit around and watch the women work. Uh, so, so we're f packing the tires with rock and dirt to give them stability and to serve as a foundation. And then we were filling bags with dirt. Um, and you, you can build with them. You lay them out, and then you put barbed wire on top to tie them together and put another round on top. And you can actually build a big dome structure with earth bags and then plaster it. Um, yes. It's, a, it's just a different way of approaching it than Cobb. Yeah. Um, and we did a lot of cooking. Uh, and uh, the men like to put on music sometimes and dance the dubka, which is 
uh, the traditional Palestinian men's dance with the handkerchiefs and stuff. And it was beautiful to see these guys were agricultural engineers and they were very serious and sometimes not quite like sure what to make of the permaculture. But when they were dancing, they were just like so light on their feet and beautiful to watch. And then Murad's wife cooked one of the meals a day for us. And um, we had some really fantastic Palestinian food. This is one of our songs to the elements that uh, we translated into Arabic. It was interesting teaching, you know, we always do a lot of ritual and ceremony in our courses and the spirituality is very important and tr tr adapting that to a group that kind of went from very religious Muslims to um, a few students who were Palestinian Americans from the Bay Area and had been to our spiral dance you know, it was an interesting challenge, but I always feel like if you focus on getting people to connect directly themselves to nature and to observe and to just take that time to be in nature and you focus on the things that are common to all of us, like earth and air and fire and water that sustain our lives, then that kind of transcends all of those religious divisions. And then I went over to Israel proper for a little visit, and this was an Israeli permaculture project that we got to visit in Tel Aviv. Um, this was a school for extremely disabled children and this is the air conditioning at the top of the school. And if you have ever had an air conditioner, you know what it does. It produces a lot of water. That's part of how it works is with cooling. So what they did was they arranged to capture all the water, store it in these big tanks, and then use it to grow food and vegetables and to do it with raised beds and with wall plantings so the kids in wheelchairs could go along there and garden and enjoy the plants. And um, just carrying on with dry land strategies, water storage, many different places. This was in France, uh, just rainwater catchment. This was in Seattle, a roof catchment in a series of barrels. Uh, I honestly don't remember what that pic Oh, that's Spain. <laughs> Where is that? Okay. Uh, in Andalusia. Uh, where we taught, and they had a very beautiful dry land garden with a syntropic food forest. Syntro syntropic food forests are uh, a system developed by a German guy named Ernst Goch in Brazil. So he developed them in wet tropical forests, and it's a very complex way of planting a food forest taking into account succession, planting things really closely together, doing a lot of chopping and dropping and mulching, feed the soil, and designing the structure sort of from the very beginning to be more self-supporting. Um, so they were doing that, trying that in a Mediterranean climate uh, with plants Close together. He also uses a lot of succulents in the system because the succulents kind of act like, um, you know, they capture water and the water sort of condenses on those big broad leaves and they actually draw moisture into the system. Lots of mulch. And their system was doing really quite amazing. Um, and they also plant in these little circles, these little wells. They call them nests.
And this is Egypt. Some of you may have seen this, but this was a beautiful retreat center that, where we taught at and all done with natural building using uh, mud, clay, some baked bricks and some unbaked bricks. In Egypt, there's basically no rain. The water all comes from the Nile, but they have, again, thousands of years of agriculture that was based on the regular flooding of the Nile, where it would flood, it would cover everything with silt, which would renew the fertility, and they would channel the waters of the Nile through canals and through irrigation and had an incredibly productive agriculture that was really the breadbasket of the ancient world. And today they still grow a lot. They often use an overstory of palms that creates this light shade that actually helps with some of the extreme heat. And you can see the pyramids in the distance. from just across the road from where we were. So we used uh, water hyacinths from the canal uh, very carefully because they can carry parasites with them to create compost. Uh, we had some of the organizers did radical theater and cultural work, so we had uh, theater exercises. That's a scarab beetle, you know, the Egyptian scarab. Um, it comes from the this dung beetle because they capture dung and they roll it up into balls and then bury it uh, under the ground. So they were seen as very sacred. They were seen as a symbol of the sun. Um, but ecologically, the scarab beetle in the desert, the dung beetle, is kind of like worms are in a moister climate. It's a really big builder of fertility because capturing all that dung and burying it, you know, is putting it back into the soil and returning those nutrients to the soil. So I think the Egyptians intuited that. They were, these were sacred for a reason because they were a big, important part of the ecology. So we did some natural building as well, not nearly with the level of commitment or skill of the ancient pyramid builders, but uh, we did make a, a little bench and we had a visit from the builder who had built all of these, and he gave us a talk on how they actually, you know, they designed this and they laid them all out basically with sticks and strings and make all of those arcs. And this is really incredibly beautiful uh, building. And the guys in our group, All right, Ajay, I got one more to show you. Did I stop sharing? No. Stop sharing. First, try to share in the PowerPoint. What? Go to PowerPoint and share. Oh. So any questions on that? And the soil is very salty here. Salty? Um, in places they can be um, because the thing about long-term irrigation is that there's often a lot of salt 
in groundwater and um, so over time that salt can build up when you're irrigating with groundwater time that's a big problem in California where they're draining aquifers to irrigate the Central Valley uh, it may have been are the reason why in Mesopotamia ancient civilization seems to have constantly moved up 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 river valleys but one of the things you can do about salt is you can uh, do organic matter and compost tea and bring back life to the soil and that life actually repels some of that salt and can desalt it. So finally, we'll go to India. Um, there's a convergence there, I think it was in 2018. And um, for me, it was really illuminating because here in the US, we often think of permaculture as being something you do in your homestead or something you do in your little farm. But in India, I met people who were working with hundreds of thousands of farmers, whole regions, and really transforming the lives of the people there. Uh, so we had a permaculture convergence, and I was also part of a permaculture design course training and social permaculture course before the convergence at this farm called Polam Farm. Um, there were still villagers and peasants that are farming with the water buffalo. Uh, that's Robin Francis, who's a very well-known Australian permaculture teacher, and we taught together. Um, and we are uh, the organizer of the convergence were Padma and uh, Narsana Kapula, who have an organization called Aranya and a demonstration farm. And this was part of their farm where they farm without any irrigation, without any power or electricity, because they want to do a demonstration of what anyone in India can do um, with the smallest amount of resources. Um, this is the design for their farm. It's laid out. It's only about five or six acres. And Narsana, were, he took one of Bill Mollison's first courses in the early 80s in India. And he went back to his home area and he started working with villagers who were very, very poor. And he helped them to get land. There were laws that made them entitled to get small amounts of land, but most of them didn't know how to work the system. So he helped them to get um, just an acre or two of land a, a piece. And then instead of farming it with, you know, industrial chemicals and farming it with the Green Revolution, which has been somewhat devastating in India, um, because it depends on high inputs of chemicals uh, that get more and more expensive and on growing things for the market that's very volatile. And it has led a lot of farmers in India uh, really to commit suicide because they get into debt and they can't pay the debts um, and they don't know what to do. Uh, so instead of doing that, he had people start growing food for themselves and growing a diversity of foods and going back to some of the traditional uh, methods of food growing. Um, some of you may know Vandana Shiva and her work. She's an amazing Indian activist and she has a farm in the north of India called Navdanya which means nine seeds and there is traditional methods of growing nine different 
grains and legumes together that both fertilize the soil and then provide uh, richness of human nutrition, complete proteins if you eat them together. So that's his demonstration farm. And this area is mostly food forest. And then this area is kind of um, polycultures of different crops. So there's some of the polycultures growing under bananas and papayas. And he, there's Narsana. And then he introduced us to these really wonderful women um, who he had worked with because he worked with the women and taught them permaculture. And they were so happy. This had transformed their lives in so many ways. There he is. Um, and there's some of our group, which again was very diverse, came from all over the world. That's Clea Chanmal, who's another Indian permaculturalist from the South, uh, who also is working with like hundreds and thousands of farmers. Um, and here's the women, and they were singing for us. They wrote all these songs about permaculture and they were going around to other villages and teaching other women. Um, and because of that, you know, it meant they had food to feed their families. Uh, it meant that they had a raised status because instead of having to go to their husbands to ask for money for food, uh, their husbands had to come to them to ask for food. Uh, now they were seen as teachers and leaders uh, and they were um, just beautiful to see how happy they were. And then we had the convergence and a nearby farm called Polam Farm. This was sort of the design they did for it. Uh, and this is some of our students and their designs. And there was a big conference in Hyderabad, uh, and the women came and the, on their beautiful saris. And I will say Narsana had done a tremendous job bringing in some of the cultural aspects of India, which is so incredibly rich. Uh, so they had drummers, they had musicians, uh, they had all kinds of beautiful things. They had this amazing altar of seeds at uh, the entrance to the conference. Um, Vandana Shiva came and spoke, and that's Padma there. And then at the convergence, they also had a whole area where villagers came to demonstrate some of the traditional village crafts, um, like pottery making, um, you know, weaving, other things. Um, this is Igo Lamos, who's from East Timor, and he's someone who has written a tropical permaculture handbook with his organization that's online that you can get and download that they make available for free for everybody. Uh, he works with schools and he had got permaculture gardens in something like 100 schools in East Timor, and they were on track to get them into every school in East Timor um, within a few years. And he also said, somebody said to us earlier today that it's important when you educate the children, you also educate the parents. Um, Yeah, here's one of the village guys demonstrating uh, the weaving. Um, one of the local guys with his water buffalo who was demonstrating plowing and how they work with the animals. Uh, this was a smith who was showing us how they'd work with a little small scale forge. And every night we had these incredible cultural performances. 
of dancers, of music. Um, and the final night, they brought in a group of tribal dancers. And then after the cultural performance, they had someone who would teach us like uh, Bollywood style dancing and everyone would dance. And then they brought in the last night of this whole group of tribal dancers who were dancing and then invited everyone to come up and dance with them. Uh, and they had also invited like a thousand farmers from the local area. So it was like everybody danced together. And um, the thing about India is, you know, a lot of times when you're in a foreign country, you feel like shy about taking photographs and you know, do people want to be photographed and do they want to be seen and observed like that? In India, like everywhere you go, people want you to take their picture. Right? And they'll, like, if you're a tourist somewhere, like this would happen to me over and over again, Indian families would come up and say, we want to take a picture with you, you know, and, make, and take pictures and they would take pictures. So we were all dancing and then they, all the kids wanted to take pictures and have everyone take pictures with them. So, um, that was a little bit about the global permaculture. So just, all right. Not sharing, screen sharing anymore, right? What? Yeah, you can flip on the lights. Yeah. So I hope this just gives you like a little bit of a feel for the scope of the movement globally, you know, that again, in the US, it's, uh, you know, it's growing all the time. Um, but it has been more focused on the individual farm or the eco village. But globally, it has made an enormous impact in some places, and has shifted uh, the way people look at growing food and shifted real people's lives in very positive ways. I'll also just mention a couple of other things. Um, you know, when Russia invaded Ukraine, there's a Ukraine, Ukrainian permaculture group that reached out to the Permaculture Association in Britain and some other areas and um, they started raising money to provide first aid materials and kits to people in affected areas. And Earth Activist Training helped with that, and together we raised tens of thousands of dollars to help provide first aid kits for that emergency. And they also helped find places in eco-villages and permaculture communities for some of the refugees. Um, there's also a group, my friend Sherry, who is with us today, uh, had been working in Afghanistan with a group of peace volunteers for 10 years um, before the US left Afghanistan. And they had all begun learning permaculture and teaching permaculture and doing incredible permaculture projects. When the US left and the Taliban took over, they had to flee and because their lives were in danger. Uh, many of them are part of an ethnic group called the Hazaras that are persecuted a lot by the Taliban. Um, and we've been raising money and helping to try to find homes and places for the Afghans. Um, it's much harder 
<coughs> to find places for Afghan refugees than for Ukrainian refugees. I'll let you figure out why. <laughs> um, but we have Earth Activist Training has raised close to $40,000 uh, to try to relocate a family of five. Um, it will either go to Canada or to Portugal. Um, and the international permaculture community, <coughs> together with the uh, Quakers and a lot of other people have raised money and brought already uh, many people. Portugal has been pretty welcoming. Other places, it's been really hard, like Canada has taken in some refugees. The US, we didn't even try. Um, it's been a lesson for me on just how extremely difficult it is to get through the bureaucracy of the immigration system in country after country. Um, but for me, again, with my background, you know, I grew up hearing over and over again the stories of all the Jews who couldn't get out of Germany because no one would take them in and no one would let them go. And so I really felt pulled to try to do something about the situation. And I think as the permaculture community globally grows and develops, um, there will be more and more instances where uh, we have to help refugees or help others. Uh, we've also, you know, shown up to do things in places like Haiti after the earthquake and New Orleans after the flood, uh, when there's natural disasters. I think there's a growing uh, field of permaculture in response to those things. And I would say earth activist training kind of uh, started this trend of going to mobilizations and actions and bringing permaculture uh, with a lot of the global justice mobilizations and then um, some of the groups in England have taken it on and developed a whole, like, permaculture sort of uh, group that works with the climate camps there. And at Standing Rock, there are people who brought in permaculture and yurts and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, and for me, also, the hope is kind of like being able to support Sunshine at Standing Rock and some of the work she and Kamimi La are doing, that that doesn't just become a like, let's show up and do something for the disaster and then go, but it helps if you can stay on, um, build real relationships and build into something that can actually grow and change lives and become part of the culture, the permanent culture. So I think I'm going to stop there. Again, I'm open for questions. Um, I don't know if we can put questions in the chat for those who are online, but I'll take a look at it and see. Um, I see, can we put rocks and trees when they're in danger of being blown over or falling over due to saturated soil here in Sonoma County. I would say give it a try and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, okay, more on biochar. Yeah, that was the quick and dirty of it. <laughs> Uh, and we'll be talking about, we'll be making it here in class. Um, but yeah, it can be used as a soil amendment. Uh, you can charge it with uh, compost so that you're sort of filling up those little hotel rooms with microorganisms and seeding the soil with lots of biological life. Uh, there's other ways you can use it. Charles, do you want to come up and say something about what you've done with biochar? 
This is Charles Williams, my co-teacher. Uh, you can. <laughs> There we go. There you go. <laughs> so um, we're going to be making biochar in class. We'll talk more about it then. Yeah. The biochar um, can be used as a soil amendment, which is how it commonly uses is used in permaculture to um, help hold water and nutrients. But we've also used it in a lot of natural building. So as a sand substitute. Um, when we either in concrete um, or when we're doing our cobs, so we're taking the sand and replacing it, um, you know, it can be 10% replacement up to about 90% replacement. Um, we've done walls, we've done floors and plasters, and there's some really um, interesting characteristics. Um, it helps decrease mold, it can absorb more water, it is a carbon solution because uh, biochar is carbon. So by replacing the sand, you're actually making a carbon sink, so it can help uh, help with the climate change issue. So, yeah, you can do a lot with uh, biochar, and we're starting to find that depending on the type of biochar, it has different characteristics. So some's really good for cleaning water, some's really good for building, some's really good for soil amending, and we're right on the edge of that. So this is some great work uh, any of you can do, is start to try mm -hmm. different ways in which to make biochar and see what are the characteristics of that biochar and how to use it. All right, um, Dusty, yeah, put rocks, you can put them on the tree roots. I don't think you're going to get heavy enough rocks that they're going to cause a problem with compaction or anything. Um, I don't know if it'll work you know, to hold those trees from the saturated soil, um, but you never know, it might be worth a try. So I think we are pretty much at our time. We tried to end by nine o'clock. Um, I wanna thank all of you online for joining us. And we hope that we'll see you. You know, we have a lot of really wonderful courses coming up online. Uh, we also have some in-person courses coming up with a restoration intensive at the end of February, where you can come and just immerse yourself in wonderful hands-on projects for 10 days and learn a lot of permaculture. Um, we'll have, in the summer, I'll be teaching with Penny Livingston up at our Eco Village in British Columbia. We'll be teaching a full permaculture design course in person, and possibly in August, I'll be teaching one in France. Uh, so if you go to earthactivisttraining.org, you can sign up to our mailing list and you'll get information on all of this wonderful stuff. Uh, and uh, have fun, regenerate, and get your hands in the earth. And I hope you've all weathered the storms. We're happy that we've got power back here and could do this live. And uh, maybe these storms will wake us up to the need to actually come back into balance with the earth. So good night, everybody. Thank you.